So before I begin, I want to thank everybody for giving me the opportunity to speak here. I did this for the first time last year uh, in Chicago, and I have to say that uh, last time and this time stand out as being one of the more um, rewarding talks that I get to give. You know, usually I'm talking to doctors and scientists at conferences, but there's something different about this group, a different kind of energy. So I really enjoy coming out here and, and having an opportunity to talk about this. So thank you. Um, so I'm going to talk uh, today about uh, the cognitive, cognitive effects of cancer treatments and, um, you know, what are some of the things we can do to help manage that and, and hopefully improve that. So my goals for today is to uh, first kind of define what this term chemo brain means and talk about what some of the common symptoms are with chemo brain. I want to talk a little bit about what we know and is that getting a little feedback there. I want to talk a little bit about what we know and what we don't know about the effects of cancer treatments on cognition. I want to also talk about how we go about evaluating patients for chemo brain and then talk about some techniques of managing those symptoms. <laughs> So I'm going to start off by defining the term cognition. I'm going to use that term a lot today. Cognition is basically an umbrella term or a general term that refers to the way we think. Things such as our memory for things and our ability to concentrate and our ability to reason and problem solve and our ability to understand and communicate. All of those different things fall under this term cognition. Again, think of it as a, 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 the many different ways we think, uh, the ways we interact with our environment. Now, this probably is not a surprise to many of you in this audience, but there are pretty high rates of changes in thinking abilities in patients with cancer that are going through cancer treatments. When you look at the literature, the rates go as high as 75% of patients at some point in time will report some concerns or some symptoms involving their thinking abilities. The severity of these symptoms vary quite a bit. Uh, they can be very subtle to the point where they're noticed and annoying to the patient, or it can be more severe where it can actually limit one's ability to carry out certain day-to-day uh, -day activities. The symptoms can also be short-lived in the sense that they might be present during treatment and maybe for a few months after, and they can also stick around. So there seems to be a subset of patients that will experience these symptoms for years after treatment. So let's talk about the term chemo brain. This is a term that's become very popular in the last decade or so. Um, and the term chemo brain, it's a little bit of a, of a bad term in my opinion because it implies that all changes in our thinking is related to chemotherapy. While chemotherapy is thought to contribute to these changes, there's lots of other treatments involved in cancer treatment that can also affect thinking, like radiation and different medication one's on or uh, coming in and out of surgeries and things like that. So I'll be using the term chemo brain to talk about chemotherapy, but it also generalizes to some of the other treatments as well. So the term chemo brain uh, basically refers to changes in thinking that relate to undergoing chemotherapy treatment. A lot of the patients I work with describe their symptoms as if they're walk as if they're walking through kind of fog all the time. Uh, so I think this picture sort of captures, I think, what a lot of people are experiencing with these types of symptoms. What do we hear? We hear nothing. Uh, I hit a button, sorry. Oh, there we go, all right. Um, so what do I hear from my patients? What are some of the common symptoms that they're reporting? Changes in memory, pretty common. So I'll hear things like, yeah, you know, I'm not remembering all the details of what people are telling me in conversations, or this is one that I experience all the time myself. You know, I walk into rooms and I forget what I was going to do when I, by the time I got into the room. You know, things like that. Uh, I hear a lot of concerns about attention and multitasking. You know, so patients will say, you know, I used to be able to juggle two or three things at one time, and now I can only do one thing and that's it. I hear a lot of, you know, uh, reports of just feeling slower, like you're lagging behind, you know, a step or two, you know. I also hear problems with coming up with words, that annoying tip of the tongue kind of thing, you know, where you're looking at something and you're saying, oh yeah, yeah pass me the, um, uh, you know, that kind of thing. That's pretty common. So these are some of the uh, more common symptoms that uh, you'll hear people uh, uh, report uh, as far as what, what they're experiencing when they're going through these treatments. So what do we know? Most of the literature on chemo brain actually comes from the breast cancer literature. There are fewer studies that specifically look at bone marrow transplant. When we look at the literature, there's a few points that really stand out. So one of the things is that there seems to be a lot of variability in the way people present. 
Some people experience changes and some people don't. And some people experience them for very brief periods of time and some stick around a lot longer. Now, as I said, a lot of the literature comes from the breast cancer you know, literature and fewer studies from bone marrow transplant. And you can't generalize necessarily between the two because bone marrow transplant and the treatments for you know, a lot of the hematological cancers are very different than what breast cancer patients go through. They often involve higher doses of chemotherapy and sometimes are combined with radiation. Uh, and when you do whole body radiation, the brain gets some radiation. So combining those two has been associated with higher risk for developing you know, neurologic and, and neurocognitive changes. So here are some of the uh, uh, things that we can take from the literature. One of the things that you see is that there appears to be about a third of patients that will show some cognitive issues or some cognitive changes before before they even undergo treatment, before they even undergo bone marrow transplant. And that's got a lot of people thinking that, all right, well, maybe the cancer itself can somehow affect brain functioning. Even though the cancer is not in the brain, something's going on where, you know, the brain seems to not be, the brain seems to be affected by this more systemic cancer. The other thing is that um, I was commenting about the variability that some, some patients experience these changes and some don't. Um, you know, that's got a lot of us interested in sort of what are those individual factors that might be contributing to making one person vulnerable and one person not so vulnerable for these symptoms. And the base rates for these uh, changes in the bone marrow transplant literature, again, vary widely with some rates up north of 70%, so it's not insignificant. I commented that there's a little bit of variability as far as... Um, you know, the course of improvement after bone marrow transplant. Some studies show that, you know, you see really nice improvements. Others show that you can still see subsets of patients that are still showing some of these cognitive problems. There's even some imaging work done uh, that, has act that has shown some changes in the brain from pre to post bone marrow transplant. So what we can see is that the brain can actually change in the sense that it can shrink a little bit. We call that atrophy. We also see changes in what's called white matter. And what white matter is, I want you to think of the brain as a bunch of different computer processors that are computing and doing all sorts of things. And those different parts of the brain, those different processors, talk to each other. And what connects all those little computer processors is the white matter. Think of them as like cables and connections. And you can see changes in the white matter in some patients that undergo this type of treatment. So there seems, again, to be some anatomic changes as well. Now, a lot of scientists are interested in trying to identify what exactly is going on that leads to these cognitive symptoms. We actually don't know. Um, there's been a number of hypotheses generated about what the causal mechanism is, but there, it's still the verdict that's out. So, for example, um, we know that chemotherapy is cytotoxic, right? Uh, it, it has to be because it, uh, we want it to kill cancer cells. But at the same time, it also can damage healthy cells. It can't differentiate very well between healthy cells and cancer cells. So, you know, there's um, evidence to suggest that uh, chemotherapy can damage those cells in our brain and can affect the DNA or that code inside those cells that tell those cells how to act and what they're supposed to be doing. Now, for a long period of time, it was believed that chemotherapy really didn't get into the brain, it stayed kind of in the body. So a lot of people, you know, kind of poo-pooed this whole idea that chemo can get in the brain and damage it. But, you know, there's some evidence now that suggests that uh, it doesn't take much to cause some damage in the brain and to affect the cells. And it does, in fact, penetrate to some degree into the brain. Uh, other scientists are interested in uh, uh, sort of an inflammatory explanation. What I mean by that is that, you know, cancer and the treatments for cancer can cause inflammation within the body. And that inflammation that occurs within the body can also affect the brain. It can cause an inflammatory response in the brain. So people are studying that as a possible causal mechanism. Another area that I'm particularly intrigued by is genetics. You know, so there's some different genes that seem to um, you know, uh, increase or decrease one's vulnerability for developing cognitive problems. So there's some genes, for example, in Alzheimer's that are pretty uh, well studied, and those same genes are being studied in, in chemotherapy patients. Uh, with the idea that those genes are very important for repairing cells when they get damaged. And, and depending on what genes you have or don't have, your ability to repair those cells might be different. So maybe the genes that you have in your body might make you more vulnerable or less vulnerable. So there's some interesting work going on in that area right now. So there's some different possible mechanisms. Now, there's a lot of other things that we need to consider that can cause cognitive symptoms that are pretty prevalent 
in cancer patients. So one of the things is that there's a much higher rate of stress and a much higher rate of emotional changes in cancer patients that are going through treatment. And what I mean by emotional changes are depression and anxiety and things like that. It's understandable. I mean, it's a very stressful time. You have changes in kind of your life role and, and things like that that can really affect one's mood. We know that these changes in mood can affect the brain, and we know that these changes in mood can affect our thinking. So that's one thing to consider. There are also medical things that can play a role. Uh, for example, take anemia. So I don't know if anybody's experienced anemia in the courses of their treatments, but basically uh, that, is, um, that affects the red blood cells and their ability to carry oxygen to the brain and to the rest of the body, and low levels of oxygen can affect our thinking as well and can cause a lot of fatigue and things like that. Uh, I mentioned fatigue, which is very common in cancer patients, and fatigue can affect things like memory and attention. Just think back to a time in your life where you were completely exhausted and how hard it is to concentrate. Imagine being like that through most of your day. That can affect thinking abilities. Um, and there's a few other things listed up here, like the type of medications you're on, um, potentially hormonal changes, depending on the types of treatments you're going through and things like that. And all of these things have been linked to um, affecting thinking abilities. So, what do you do? What do you do if you feel like you're having some of these problems? Well, the first thing to do is you talk to your doctor. You gotta bring it up to your doctor. Now, in the past, this whole idea of chemo brain wasn't very well accepted. A lot of doctors would sort of poo-poo it and say, ah, oh, you know, it's stress, it's all stress, it's all stress. We've come, I think, a long way since then, and, and it's more accepted now by practitioners. Um, uh, so I think the first step is to bring this up with your oncologist or your general practitioner. And your doctor, your medical doctor, is in a good position to order, order some different tests that can rule out some potential reversible causes of cognitive symptoms, like, again, the anemias and other types of things that can happen, medically speaking. They're also in a good position to treat things such as sleep problems and um, you know, what have you. So, you know, first thing, have a conversation with the doctor. And, and after that conversation, your physician might refer you for what's called a neuropsychological evaluation. That's what I do for my profession. You don't have to raise your hand if you're not comfortable, but has anybody had a neuropsychological evaluation in this audience? Okay, a few. All right. Um, hopefully it wasn't too traumatic. <laughs> But um, I want to talk a little bit about that, uh, what, what a neuropsychological evaluation consists of, because that's one of the main ways to sort of identify what type of cognitive issues you're having and hopefully guide treatment efforts. So a neuropsychological evaluation, oh, let me, sorry, let me go back real quick. Um, this last bullet point, that, that car picture right there, the reason why I put that up is that a lot of patients that I see say, ask me, well, why can't you just get a brain scan? Just send me for a, an MRI scan or a CT scan. Why don't I have to go through all this, this paper pencil testing? And you know, the reason is, is that brain scans show us the way your brain looks. It gives us nice pictures of your brain, but doesn't tell us anything about how it's functioning. So it's kind of like opening up a car, the hood of a car, looking at the engine. That's kind of what a brain scan will show you, what it looks like. But until you take that car for a test drive, you really can't you know, get a good understanding of what's working and what's not working with that engine. And that's where neuropsychological testing comes in. So the first part of a neuropsychological exam is the clinical interview. And in my opinion, that's just as valuable, if not more valuable, than actually putting people through testing. It's really important to hear from the patient what they're experiencing on a day-to-day -day basis. So during the interview, you know, again, trying to better identify what are those cognitive symptoms? When did they start? How long has it been going on? And also trying to assess what other factors might be contributing. So, you know, talking about your mood and your stress levels and how you're managing and coping with that. Talking about what kind of physical symptoms you're experiencing and things like that. So that clinical interview kind of sets the stage for the evaluation. Then the next part of the neuropsych exam is the actual testing part. And it's, we use paper, pencil, question, answer, and sometimes computerized tests that allow us to, again, test drive a certain part of the brain or a certain side of the brain or a certain circuit in the brain or a certain function in the brain. So we look at things like your learning and memory and your speed of your thinking and, and your language abilities and your spatial skills and this thing called executive functions, which think of like, what does an executive of a company do? You know, higher level reasoning and problem solving and, and things like that. And we have tests that allow us to look at these different areas. Now, in a lot of hospital systems, we don't have what we call baseline data to compare with, okay? Meaning that you didn't get tested before you went through all your treatments. And usually, you know, we'll see these patients could be months and even years after treatments. 
I'm a big proponent of getting baseline testing done. And at my hospital, you know, we're trying to do that on a lot of our patients so you can actually compare pre to post, which increases sensitivity and gives us a much better understanding of what's going on. But in cases where we don't have that baseline testing, what we do is we compare how you do on a given test to large groups of people like you, similar in age and education and background, but that don't have cancer and haven't gone through cancer treatments to see kind of where you are falling on the on the curve. And that can tell us, you know, where are you where you should be or are you having more problems in certain areas. And our evaluations also include assessment of mood and, and things like that. So these are some examples of some of the tests that we might use. Uh, these are easy examples, but uh, on the top left is a spatial task that we use where, you know, the patient's given some blocks and uh, they have to create designs uh, that they're shown on a, on a picture in front of them. They have to manipulate the blocks. Uh, there's a pro uh, the one in the center is a reasoning task where you see some shapes and then there's a missing square and you have to pick the one from below that fits. Anybody want to guess that one? Okay, we'll skip that. Um, the one all the way to the right is uh, uh, what we call a processing speed measure. It's a simple task. You know, what we want to know is how quickly you can do it. So you have to copy all the, uh, you have to put in all the symbols that go with those numbers as fast as you can. Uh, at the bottom left is a language test where you have to pick the one that's most like the one up top in meaning. There's a, in the center is an executive functioning task where you have to sort cards. You have to, you know, sort them based on certain principles and then we even test motor functioning too in, in, in the exam. And then after you're done doing all that testing, uh, I like to meet with my patient the same day so they don't have to wait for the feedback. So we'll meet, we'll go over the results, we'll talk about how things went and what it tells me about your brain. Uh, we do a lot of education and we start talking about treatment planning. What can we do to kind of address the issues that we identified in your exam? So that sets the stage for this next part of the talk and that is, well, what can we do about these cognitive symptoms? And the treatment largely depends upon the kind of problems you're having. You know, so we treat attention problems different than we might treat memory problems. And we might treat that differently than we might treat what we call these executive problems. We can broadly break down our treatment options into three categories. We have what's called behavioral, behavioral or compensatory strategies. So these are things that you can do in your day-to-day -day life that kind of work arounds, you know, for these problems. Uh, we have something called cognitive rehabilitation therapy. That's where you meet with a specialist, a therapist that uh, does specific training to improve your brain functions. Uh, and we have pharmacological options as well. And I'm going to go through these in a little detail right now. So I'm going to start off talking about, oops, before I, sorry, before I move on, uh, the other thing that's really important, I think, in the treatment of, of you know, chemo brain is education. A lot of times patients don't even know that cognitive changes are a potential side effect and they get blindsided by this, you know, as they're going through their treatments or after their treatments. And, you know, I'm a firm believer that if you can prepare a patient for the possibility, they can cope with it better. And if you can even maybe train them on some strategies before they happen, you'll be better able to use those strategies. So uh, I try to meet with patients even before they go through treatment if I can and, and start doing some of this stuff. So um, now I'm going to talk a little bit about some of these strategies. <clears throat> I'm going to start with memory. As far as memory is concerned, we know that there's certain things you can do that can help improve getting that information into your memory. We know that the more you work with that information, the more you see that information, the more you think about that information, the better it's going to get put into your memory. So repeated multiple exposures with information is important, but also doing something with it. You know, you kind of, you know, take that information and think about it and reflect on it can help with getting that into your memory. So. Things like repeating back things you hear in conversations in your own words, or if you're reading and you're having trouble remembering some of, some of the things you read, taking breaks and paraphrasing what you've just read in your head and then going on and doing that over and over again can help. So again, working with that information. And then there are these tricks called mnemonic strategies. Has anybody ever heard of those? Has anybody used those? Okay, cool. Do they help? Yeah, good. All right, good. You guys said no, talk's over. Uh, <laughs> no, I'm kidding. So, you know, mnemonic strategies are, again, st you know, strategies to help remember things. So if you think of, um, like, one of the more common mnemonic strategies is, um, 
you know, taking the first letter of, of something you need to remember and putting it together. So, like, how do we remember the uh, colors of the rainbow, right? Roy G. Biv, you know, they kind of clue us into what the colors are. And how do you remember the planets, you know, in their order? There's certain, you know, mnemonics for that. So, you can create your own mnemonics to help remember things. And, and it works quite well. Once you get the swing of it, it takes a little bit, but it can help quite a bit. And there's different strategies as well. That's beyond the scope for me to go through all the mnemonics, but there's some pretty good books that can actually uh, walk you through some of these different mnemonic strategies. I'm a big fan of using you know, devices and other things like that to help assist memory. So what I'm getting at are things like um, to-do lists and day planners and technology. So if you're not adverse to technology, it's quite amazing what some, what some things can do and how it can help your memory. So I'm going to go through some things real quick, and I, and I call this the good, the bad, and the ugly uh, for a reason. There's a, you know, I, a lot of patients come in and they'll say things like, oh yeah, yeah, I take notes. I, I, I do sticky notes. And then you find out that there's sticky notes everywhere. You know, sticky notes on their dog, there's sticky notes everywhere. So, you know, there's a good way of doing things and then there's a not so good way of doing things. And, and I think a lot of it comes down to, again, how structured you can keep it and, and how organized you can keep it. So these are some examples of things we don't want to do. But these are some examples of things that can be very helpful. Um, so starting with uh, those that embrace technology, um, I'm assuming almost everybody here has a smartphone or a tablet at home. Um, so there are tons of apps out there, and I'll make reference to a few of them in this talk, that can really help organize your day, can really help set reminders for things, uh, and can help take some of that burden off your brain and help you remember things better so you don't forget. Um, <clears throat> there's also even features in the phone itself, like how many people have noticed, uh, you know, with the Google search bar, there's a little microphone there, right? You guys notice that? You know you can touch that microphone and, and talk to your phone and say things like, Remind me to take out the garbage on Thursday at 7 a.m. And the phone will say, thank you. And then Thursday at 7 a.m., your phone starts talking to you saying, remember to take out the garbage. So, you know, there's a lot of neat little features that I'll work with my patients with to try to learn and we'll practice and we can kind of, you know, start integrating that into their day-to-day -day life that can help quite a bit with those type of things. For those that don't like technology, you know, you go old school. You know, there's day planners. You go to Office Max or, home or Office Depot and they make these teacher's day planners that are broken down into 15 minute slots and there's uh, areas to write notes and you can put all the things you have to remember in that and you can even set reminders by going a few days back and putting in reminders to, for, for upcoming events. The key to success is it has to become part of who you are. It has to become almost your religion. You know, you can't just kind of haphazardly do it and check it. You know, you got to get in the habit of checking it every day at breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and get in the habit of putting everything in it. And the key is you keep everything in one central location and source. Don't have 20 lists. Try to put it all into one source. Uh, but these things can be very helpful. And, you know, creating to-do lists like this where you can prioritize your activities and categorize them into level of importance. You can check them off as you do them. can also be very helpful. Now, as far as specific problems that we can hear, um, you know, take somebody that is forgetting to take their medications all the time or they can't remember if they took their medications. So using a pillbox, that's huge. You know, you set your pillbox up, you have a visual reminder right in front of you and you know if you took it or not. When you look at it, if there's no pills in that day, you've taken your medications. And then you can also use alarms. You can use your phone or you can actually get a, a wrist alarm that can alert you to when you need to be taking your medications as well. So when you pair those together, you can you know, significantly reduce the amount of forgetfulness when it comes to medications. The, 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 the tape recorder up there you know, is another thing that really works well and can be really beneficial. So how many people here have been in the car driving, let's say, and something pops in your mind that you have to remember and then gone by the time you get to where you have to be. Show of hands? Okay. It happens to me all the time. So by carrying a little micro cassette recorder that's the size of a gum stick, you know, you can just take it out of your pocket while you're driving, make a recording real quick of what you want it to remember, and then you check that periodically throughout the day. It'll limit how often that happens to you. Again, these are workarounds that can make your life just a little bit easier. How many people lose things all the time? Keys, phones, things like that. Okay, so um, there are some products out there like Tile, uh, which I've used that uh, works nicely. They're pretty affordable. You can get them on Amazon and you can attach it to pretty much anything and you can find things. You, like if you attach it to your keys and you lose your keys, you can use your phone to find your keys. If you lose your phone, the Tile can actually locate your phone. So it's kind of neat. Yeah, yeah. Um, these are some apps that uh, I have some experience with that uh, work real well. Uh, Cozy is an app that um, 
it, what's neat about it is this. You can set up a to-do list and there's a grocery list option in it and a calendar. And the cool thing about this app is that you can sync it among different people. So, you know, let's say my wife and I both sync our accounts and I'm off in the grocery store having to buy something and I forgot to put something on the list. My wife can type in milk and it immediately appears on my phone. Uh, and I can do the same thing. Same thing with to-do lists and I can put my dates in the calendar. If she schedules a doctor appointment, it'll show up on my calendar. So it allows family to work together, you know, and, and, and minimize some of this forgetfulness. Um, there are apps that can help with remembering medications. Uh, MediSafe Pill Reminder is a really nice, easy to use app that has tons of information. Uh, it tells you when you have to take your medications and things like that and reminds you and, and it's a very useful app. Um, and then uh, there are apps that can help you with remembering to pay bills. So Prism Bills and Personal Finance will remind you when you have to pay your bills. It'll give you several day notice, several, you know, whatever notice you want to set up. Uh, it organizes all your finances for you. You can even pay your bills directly from that app, which is kind of nice. The other two up here are not so relevant probably to this group. Uh, these are ones that I'll recommend, let's say, in patients that have really severe cognitive issues or if I'm working with a dementia population. These are things that you can uh, keep track of people. So if you have somebody that wanders a lot, you can um, set it up so that if they leave a certain area, it'll notify you that that happened. Um, these are non-technology things that one can do. So I was talking about misplacing things like your keys or your glasses. You know, one of the things you do is, well, you, you put them in the same exact place immediately upon entering your house. So take your keys. You can set up a little, you know, key ring right by the door that you come in and out. And every time you come in, like religion, like, you know, put your keys up there. Don't deviate from that. And the same thing with glasses. You can put a little place to put that. Or your bills, you can make a little organizer and, and set that up. Um, for Take, for example, uh, people that lose their cars in parking lots, which... I do. <laughs> um, you know, something like parking your car in the same exact quadrant of a parking lot every time. Don't deviate. Make it part of who you are. So I'm going to park in the northeast side of the parking lot every time so you know where you should be walking every time you leave a store. Um, <clears throat> the other picture there uh, gets at when you, for example, have to take something with you and then you leave the house and you forget. That's also something that I do kind of often. So and you get in the habit of the minute you think about it, oh yeah, I gotta take this to the dry cleaner, you immediately hang it from the doorknob in the door that you leave. So it's a visual reminder. Again, these are just examples of workarounds. When it comes to attention, there's a few things you can do to help optimize attention. Um, everybody thinks multitasking is great. People like to brag about their multi multitasking abilities. The literature actually suggests that you're better off focusing on one task you know, as opposed to trying to focus on more than one task. So I really encourage patients, don't do the whole multitasking thing. Try to just really zone in and focus on that one task. Um, try to be an active participant in conversations where you're reflecting back what people are saying. That'll help you stay engaged in conversations. Try to control your environment. Don't let your environment control you. So try to eliminate distractions where you can. And I'll show you some pictures in a minute uh, of that. The other thing is everybody's got different attention spans. Some people can go a half an hour, 45 minutes, an hour before they start fading. And some people are more like five minutes. So learn how your brain operates and plan more frequent breaks. Um, engaging in self-talk can help. So as you're walking around your house and you're thinking about things like, oh yeah, yeah, I gotta, I gotta go get that, you know, from this room. As you're walking to that room, talk out loud. I know people will look at you and maybe think you're kind of weird, but it'll help. So do a lot of that self-talk. Um, I put journaling down because, again, everybody's a little different when their good and bad times are during their day from an attention point of view. And if you can identify your, your peaks, your ups and your downs, you can schedule cognitively demanding tasks during the times where you're feeling most alert and, and most attentive. And then finally, exercise. I can't emphasize exercise enough. There's a very large body of literature that shows that regular cardiovascular exercise can enhance attention. Uh, you don't need to be doing, you know, marathons. You don't need to be powerlifting. Just keeping your body moving can be very powerful. I'm just going to go a few minutes over, I promise. Um, I talked about controlling your environment and not letting your environment control you. This is what I mean by that. Visual clutter is your worst nightmare. All right? So spending some time organizing your house or organizing your home office or wherever you like to sit and do your tasks, uh, trying to organize can really help a lot. 
Another way of controlling your environment is you can face away from high traffic areas. So, for example, if you're in school and you're studying somewhere, you don't want to be where there's a lot of visual traffic going on. If you're working, try to position yourself in your office or your cubicle where you're not facing that traffic. You can also uh, use uh, earplugs or noise cancellation headphones to um, block out sounds. So sounds can be very distracting and, and this is a good way to try to limit that. I mentioned that there's something called cognitive rehabilitation therapy. Um, and again, what that is, is that you meet with a therapist that does drills and training exercises to help improve your attention or memory or other areas. And then they also work on teaching you these compensatory strategies that I was reviewing here. We can't expect you guys to walk out of here and, 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 and master all these compensatory strategies. It takes time and it takes work. And um, if you can't do it on your own, you know, meeting with one of these therapists can really help with that. They'll tailor it to kind of what are the demands in your life. And most big hospital systems have these type of therapists. They're often housed within speech therapy, speech and cognitive rehabilitation therapy. Sometimes you'll find a psychologist or a neuropsychologist that will do this as well. And there's data to show that participating in, in this type of therapy can help can help with reducing these cognitive symptoms. There's also lifestyle changes. Um, so, for example, uh, paying attention to your sleep. Your brain needs sleep to function well. Your brain needs sleep to heal. So, sleep disturbance is uh, not uncommon in, in patients with cancer going through treatments. Um, so, paying attention to that and, and getting some help with that if you need it. Uh, help can be in different forms. So. Uh, you know, for example, sleep hygiene. You know, what are you doing? What are your behaviors leading up to when you get in bed and when you're in bed? Sometimes tweaking those can help you fall asleep and stay asleep. Sometimes people need a little more help, and that's where you need to have a conversation with your doctor about some sleep medication if need be. Um, I talked about exercising already. Uh, some people find yoga and mindfulness exercise to be very beneficial. You know, so that's another thing to consider as well. Treating emotional uh, changes and emotional issues and stress is very important. This often gets kind of, you know, minimized. Um, and that's something that should not get minimized uh, because it can really take its toll on you and can affect your thinking. So if you're concerned that there might be some depression or anxiety or anything like that, you know, there are many good options out there. There's different types of therapy, talk therapy that are very effective for this kind of stuff. Uh, and then there's also pharmacological options if you can't get the benefit you want, let's say, from talk therapy. Support groups are, are great, so you can hear what, how people cope with some of their issues and you can learn from that and just get support as you go through your journey. I get asked all the time about brain games, um, and that's why I included this slide. Here's my take on brain games. I think keeping your brain active is really important. We know that keeping your brain stimulated is neuroprotective for a variety of things. You know, the dementia literature looking at Alzheimer's, you know, a lot of people are focusing on, on, again, mental stimulation throughout life and how that could potentially delay, maybe, I don't know, maybe prevent even the onset of some of these things. So, you know, there's no doubt that mental stimulation plays a big role in, in brain health as well as in mood and quality of life. But here's where it gets dangerous. I have people come in and say things like, oh, yeah, you know, I, 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 there's, this, there's this program that's $8,000 and, and I'm going to sign up for this thing because it's going to make my memory better. Or, you know, people that drive themselves crazy about, you know, they have to do certain things or I got to do only luminosity and I got to do it for 10 hours a day. That's not what it's about. What it's about is just keeping your brain active and there's many things you can do that don't cost any money to do that. So reading, playing cards. Uh, being involved in social stimulating activities and things like that can, are all ways to keep your brain stimulated. Uh, if you like luminosity, go for it. You know, it's about doing things that are fun, that you will stay engaged with, and that you'll keep doing. Uh, but don't drive yourself crazy over what you should be doing. It's more that you're just doing something. And then we have some medication options. There are no FDA-approved um, treatments for a chemo brain, but there are some medications that can work well in, in some individuals. One of the medications that I will sometimes uh, you know, recommend are stimulants. These are medications that are used to treat kids with attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. They work well in individuals that are struggling with fatigue. It can really help with that arousal, and keeping you know, somebody feeling more alert during the day. And it can also help if there's some you know, attentional problems that are going on. So you know, I've had some patients that have really gotten some good response. Uh, not everybody has the same response, but it's something that you could talk to your doctor about and you know, they might recommend going through proper evaluation for that. 
if there are mood issues, as I said, uh, therapy is an option. Uh, there's also some medication options if, if that's needed. You know, again, with sleep, you know, behaviorally trying to correct sleep hygiene behaviors, and, and if you're still struggling with sleep after that, maybe having a conversation with your doctor about, about that. Uh, there are also medications that have cognitive enhancing effects that are used, for example, in, in Alzheimer's. They're not really approved or there's no real good data to support it in this type of situation with chemo brain. But um, I've had some patients sent to me that are on Aricep that, you know, I don't know. I don't, I don't again, think the data necessarily supports that. So my, the hope is that by, you know, tweaking things, by, you know, Taking, taking a look at kind of what you're doing and reevaluating and maybe trying to use more of these compensatory strategies, uh, you know, you can start clearing some of this fog that you're experiencing as you're going through your day. So that's my presentation. Uh, I'd love to hear some questions. Hi. Um, I just wanted to make a comment. Um, I have issues with uh, short-term memory, of course, but then um, I find that when I'm going through a stressful period, like a month or two ago, I was having a lot of stress at work, and I found that um, I was making silly mistakes and not, like, like for example, when I was driving, it was like my autopilot was not working at all. Absolutely. So if I was driving, you know, I could run a red light, you know, because I was, I, I was, there was no autopilot. So, um, but str the stress has gotten better in my life now, and I feel a lot better. So, right. you know, I think so that... So that speaks again to the power of mood and stress and how it can affect our brain. Um, you know, stress really pulls those attentional resources away from what you need to be using it for. Right. Uh, and it's so important to stay on top of that and manage that. So what, you know, when I interview patients, it's, that's kind of, that's the stuff that I explore. Oh, so you're under a very stressful period. Did that resolve? And what, what effect did that have on your cognitive symptoms? So we try to kind of see are there correlations between that. Yeah. I have yeah. one more question. Okay. Uh, I've seen the uh, over-the-counter ads about this drug that's made from jellyfish or whatever that's supposed to increase your short-term memory. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, my thoughts about that and all the other over-the-counter stuff is that, um, you know, A, none of that stuff is FDA approved, and two, there's no real good research or clinical trials that support the efficacy of that. I'm not saying that they help or don't help. What I'm saying is that if there's not data where they've done double-blind, randomized studies, you should question you know, what you're going to get from that. Uh, and sometimes these things are not, they're, they're not inexpensive. I mean, you can spend a lot of money on these things. And, you know, again, the data is not there really to support that. So that, you know, I, I caution my patients about that. And the other thing, too, is you've got to let your doctors know what you're on. Because if you're doing all these over-the-counter stuff, we don't know how they're interacting with some of the medical treatments. I don't know if you want to add to that. And back to your first comment um, about stress and then having more trouble with your memory. That's why people find mindfulness and yoga um, helpful for their, what happens is if you can control your concentration, your attention, then you can input the information in your brain better and then it can go into short term and then long term memory. So if your brain is distracted, it's not going to go in in the first place. So that, um, that stress. If you find yourself in a period of a lot of stress, make sure that you write in your calendar that you are taking time for yourself and mm -hmm. you're doing nice, easy things that help you relax, that you find um, useful. And I'll, and I'll just add real quick about stress, too. I didn't even talk about it. I apologize. There was this app, I think, that I referenced in one of my slides called, I think it's Just Relax or something like that. I haven't played with it too much, but I've heard really good things about it. So it, it teaches you different relaxation techniques that you would do, like in psychotherapy even. So diaphragmatic breathing and progressive muscle relaxation. And, and it helps you kind of go through those exercises, which can help quite a bit with, with stress and the physical effects of stress. I have a question about... Um the myelin sheath, uh, the effects mm -hmm. of long, I'm 10 years out, um, but I started having really bad migraines, and I've noticed a change in my concentration. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I teach, so I have to kind of multitask, do a lot of different things that, you know, quickly with the, the kids, but I notice a big difference. Is there research going on about, um, you know, ways to improve or, or compensation? Because I... They said that there was damage, um, you know, um, in, you know, they did MRIs and things. To the myelin sheath? Yeah. So they were getting at this, remember how I was talking about white matter? Yeah. Yeah, that, that's what white matter is. It's the myelin, it's the myelin sheath over the cells uh, that can break down. And you can see that on a brain scan. It just yeah. looks like white puppy stuff. 
So are they doing research to try to prevent that, or are they or just or if to compensate? Or, right. or, or, or like, uh, you know, yeah. is it sort of like the way you have per peripheral neuropathy in your feet or mm. your legs? Um, you know, is there some way? Because I noticed I had that after yeah. my transplant, and mm. then I was able that kind of went away. But well, um, is, is there going to yeah. be something? Yeah, I mean, uh, this goes back to kind of some of the different things we talked about. I mean, you know, using and try to incorporate some of those compensatory strategies. I mean, being a teacher, it's a, it's a very demanding job, and you're right, a lot of multitasking. I've had a lot of patients who are teachers, and they spend some time going through some cognitive re rehabilitation therapy to w work on how to take these strategies and really implement them into their real life. So, you know, that, that's one thing, for example, that you would focus on. Um, from an attention point of view, again, you know, um, we talked a little bit about medications. I don't, I'm not recommending a medication for you, but, you know, that could be something that might come up in one of the evaluations if it is an attentional problem. Um, uh, but yeah, there's different things you can do to help minimize the impact that it's having on you. And it's going to be the type of things that we talk about. But, you know, easier said than done. And sometimes it does pay to try to hook up with a good therapist that can work on these things with you. And a neurologist would be that, because I see someone at UF Health. Uh, is that UF, that, University of Florida? Uh, um, in Orlando. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and Dr. Nick. And okay. It, he's a specialist in that, so is that sure. somebody that I go to for these types of... Yes, yeah, so you, have, you have a few avenues. You can go directly from your neurologist to uh, a cognitive speech rehab department if there is one there. You, you know, your doctor can write a referral and get you right into that. Uh, you can go via the route of your neurologist for, to a neuropsychologist to get an evaluation to help kind of fine tune what those core issues are and then do some rehab or work with that neuropsychologist. But the neurologist is probably a good place to start with to talk about these concerns and, and kind of see where to go from there. And I would just throw in like something you could do immediately would be to start um, logging your week and see um, like what you're doing and what your tasks are and when you notice you're having more trouble because you might actually find that in your weekly routine, there's a point where you're more stressed or you know, maybe it's you're prepping for a test that's coming up or you had friends over for dinner the night before. There might be something in your complete routine that um, you could pull back or dial back to help mitigate those problems. Um, and sometimes it might seem like your week is the same from week to week, but it's really not. And you need to factor in other things like how good did you sleep, you know, just, you know, what's going on hormonally within you and, you know, and, you know, did you eat well or, so being real detailed for a couple of weeks should give you an idea if there's a pattern there. And, and I'll just say one more thing. You know, we, we talked a lot about compensatory strategies and stuff like that. And I know almost everyone in this room is probably doing some of those. And you're probably thinking, I've tried that. Some of you are thinking, I tried that, didn't work. Again, it, the difference between trying something and making it part of who you are, almost to, dare I say, an obsessive compulsive kind of level, that can sometimes make or break the success of it. So, you know, just having a day planner where you sporadically check it or use it some of the time is not going to work. You know, or, you know, you gotta, you gotta really do these things, practice these things and make them part of your everyday routine. Yeah. And let me back up one more step to that to kind of tag on with what you're saying. Um, I, in working with um, survivors from point of diagnosis through end of life, one of the things that I've always told my people and along with their caregivers is that you're in a new car now, basically. Mm -hmm. You had a really cool, fast car that you really liked and then without noticing, like you didn't even notice, somebody took out the engine and just put a little like four cylinder in there. And that was before you got your diagnosis. You know, you're driving along, you're like, uh, something's wrong with my car. And the next thing you know, you're actually down a model, and then you had your transplant. And if you're not careful and you don't pay attention to your car, you might end up in like a gremlin, and, and you can't get it to go at all, okay? So your goal is to try to get back to your original car, but you can't drive the current car as though you're in the original car. And that's what most people try to do. So you have to learn your new body. You're in a new body. Mm -hmm. You're not the same body that you used to be. Your brain, if you're not having pain, our brains are not very good at remembering how old we are or what's going on. It only happens like when we're having pain. So once you're past the, the, the transplant part and you're not a patient and you're trying to be back in your life, you're, you might accidentally try to drive the car as though it was an original car. 
So you really have to take moments back and, and use things like journaling and really figure out how far can I go on a tank of gas? You know, how fast can I leave the stoplight? You know, like, so how much sleep do you need? You know, how much hydration do you need? How much activity can you tolerate? And, and, and once you get to really know who you are, then you can put in these compensatory strategies and everything. But you can't drive this new, this car like it was before, because it's not. Uh, for patients that are on uh, maintenance therapy of uh, uh, chemo, like Revlimid, do you find that over a period of time uh, their cognition is becoming uh, less and less? And uh, you talk about treatment with medications, but if, is there any research being done on actually uh, overcoming the effect of chemotherapy, therapeutic uh, medicines? So, so not, the, we're not just treating them, but uh, uh, diminishing that effect. So the first part of your question about the maintenance chemo, most of the scientific literature is on adjuvant chemotherapy. So you know, new lines of chemotherapy in somebody. There's not a lot of research looking at kind of maintenance chemotherapy over time. Um, I think the answer to that question is complex. I think it depends on factors uh, that relate to the patient. I think it depends on what that chemo agent is, for example, and other circumstances like that. So there's not a there's not a good answer to the first part of your question. The second part, I, I was having trouble. Yeah. Well, um, here I'll, I'll I'll take this one. Go for it. <laughs> okay. So I firmly believe in our brains, what we call neuroplastic ability, the neuroplasticity, meaning our brains desire to be well and whole. I mean, that's how people can have a stroke and have a part of their brain die and they can do therapy and be able to use their arm again and talk again and walk again because we, because the brain will remap what areas are doing what. And we, you know, he's right, we don't have good research. That's why I'm now researching and not doing my clinical work because I'm trying to contribute to this lack of knowledge that we're, that we unfortunately have. But I really, really believe in the use it or lose it. I mean, if you, if you had um, a car accident and you were laying in the bed and you just did not get out of the bed, your, your quadriceps would not work, your lungs would not work so good, your heart wouldn't work so good. And if you don't ever do anything to make it better, why would it get better? It's not going to get better, you know? And I, I really do believe, even though we don't have hard evidence and all these trials, we have to start somewhere. And I'm starting with the belief that if you give in and you're, you're a survivor and here's your bar and you're like, well, there's my bar, and you don't challenge yourself or try to push above it, why would you get any better? You know, so if you, if you, there, I've, I've had plenty of people that have on, um, on maintenance levels and it's almost like their body kind of just becomes accustomed to it. It's, it's similar to when people are on um, long-term pain medicine because they have metastatic bone disease. When you're initially on it, you should not be driving a car. But I've tried to find the research to tell my people when it's okay to drive a car. Okay, like because eventually, I mean, you can, if you're going to be on this medicine forever, we're not. Nobody will tell you to never drive a car. They'll tell you to not drive a car initially, but at a certain point the brain kind of acclimates to it and works around it, and the person actually is okay to drive a car. You know, and there's a certain level of tolerance to it. So just because I can't tell you the research because there isn't any research and I can't tell you all the mechanisms, from clinical practice, if you use it, you're more likely to do better. If you don't use it, you're definitely not going to get better, and if anything, you'll get worse. So our bodies and our brains were meant to be used. So and, and being flexible too, you might not be able to use it the same way you used right. it in the it's past. Right, not the original I mean, car. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that, you know, uh, you brought up plasticity. I mean, yeah. it, it's plasticity is a complex thing. You mm -hmm. know, how the brain tries to repair itself, and and unfortunately, the older we get, the less plastic our brain gets to a certain degree. But that doesn't mean that you still can't compensate mm -hmm. and maybe recruit other resources to still perform a given function or a task. Mm -hmm. Uh, but it's being flexible, and she's absolutely right. It's kind of, you know, you got to use it. You fight through, you got to, you know. 
So the question is, uh, as a caregiver, what can you do to help somebody with memory and things like that? Um, I assume we'll both answer this question, right? I mean, as a caregiver, uh, you can also do some of the things that we talked about here. So um, leaving notes and uh, putting things on the calendar uh, to help the patient remember things. Some of those apps, if you like those apps, like Cozy, that's a partner kind of thing that you get to do. Um, so you get to put things in and, and he can put things in and things like that. Um, you know, helping also structure the environment a little bit, you know, kind of taking a look at the living environment and figuring out, well, how can we maybe reduce some of the, you know, that visual clutter that I was talking about, you know, uh, being part of the medication management part as well. So the pill box, you know, if there's a lot of forgetfulness for meds, I like to bring in a family member to help with that, to set up that pill box on that Monday morning and then periodically check it through the week to see whether there's medication compliance. So there's actually a lot the caregiver can do to help out. Um, you know, I, what I want to see happen is a caregiver to provide whatever level of assistance that's needed, but at the same time allow that individual, the patient, as much autonomy as we can give. Because we don't want to take over fully, right? We talked about that. Right. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. So, um, yes, yeah, so on that, um, the activities that, are, um, that cannot have failure, okay, so like medication, you don't want errors with the medication, and finances. Those are the two biggies. So I, w I wouldn't say do it for your person because you, like, like you were saying, you want to love your person and help them, but you don't want to debilitate them. If you do all of the medication and you do all of the finances, they don't ever get to practice. So don't, so do it together, but don't let failure happen on that. If it's something that's okay to quote unquote fail on, like, forgot to start the dishwasher, no big deal, you know, but the really important things be the, the crutch for their brain. So like go to the doctor's appointments because there might be a medication change, you know, there might be some little vital piece of information that's thrown out real quick and, and you can help do it and then afterwards process it together and just say, hey, so what do you remember from this visit? Or hey, why don't you set up the pill box and I'll watch you know, and then check for errors because it challenges your person to think on those harder things, but you're not, you're being a safety net for them. Right. The, pa the, the, caregiver? the patient or the caregiver? Yeah, so the question, so it's on recording here, is you're asking, what about in situations where the patient is just full force ahead, you know? Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Totally opposite of the solutions. The they said being they don't want to be organized. They don't want to. Oh. Go ahead. They're, we, terribly, we, they're, we terribly, the they're, they're very organized. Yes. Okay. okay, so they're very organized and they're doing a lot of stuff and they can't slow down. Well, I think this kind of again maybe speaks to your analogy. I really like your analogy about the car example is that, you know, sometimes you just need to take a break and reevaluate. You know, and, and, and it takes a lot of effort to slow that tempo down and the caregiver can actually help with that a little bit too. Um, and and I, I can appreciate that because that's exactly what my brain would do. My body would be like, no, and my brain would be like, let's go do this. And, you know, so I get it. I totally get that. So what I try to do, what I would need somebody to tell me is to be smarter than my brain. So try to get them to understand your goal is to be smart enough to know where your limits are. And that gives that kind of person another challenge, a different kind of challenge. Because right now, a lot of my um, patients felt the need to not be sick anymore and to not be a patient. So they're trying to be back in their original spot, and they're kind of denying to themselves where they have limits. So if you can get your person to realize that they are safer and better and more independent and the quality of life is better, if they can be smarter than their tendency to try to overdo it. It's tricky, but if your person has that personality, they'll understand what I'm saying.